coronavirus struck the United States with a vengeance not seen in modern history. Put this on your face. What we're seeing now in actual real time is something that's unprecedented. This is something that we have never seen before, at least in our generation. Healthcare workers across the country are risking their lives to save others. We are in a crisis state. We desperately need help. It's a, it's a war without bullets. Being covered in COVID is, it's walking into the hospital and feeling like every part of the hospital is a dirty zone. The number of cases adding up, climbing exponentially, dozens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. We begin tonight with breaking news, and it is dire. New models just released by the White House show as many as 240,000 people could die in the U.S. from coronavirus. The question is how large a price we will pay. We know we will lose more. How many more will be determined by the decisions we make and the actions we take now? Senor, senor, senor. Latinos are at the center of it all, in the front of long lines of unemployment. We don't know when we're gonna go back to work and if all of us will be back. And on the front lines of service to others, Latinos are in the crosshairs of the coronavirus. It's clear that a majority of the new cases and a disproportionate number are coming from minority communities. 21 zip codes with the highest rate of hospitalizations, 20 have, high, have greater than average black and or Latino populations. In 44 states and Washington, D.C., the percentage of Latinos infected by the virus surpasses their share of the population. In 10 states, it's more than four times greater. Why is it that the poorest people always pay the highest price? As the country has shut down, reopened, and is now shutting down again amid surging cases, Latinos are once more among the most vulnerable. Good evening, bienvenidos. I'm Marielena Salinas reporting from Miami, Florida, where like in the rest of the world, we are navigating a crisis. The unimaginable has happened. Just in the first half of this year, the coronavirus has taken over 125,000 of our loved ones in the US, more than any other country in the world. And it has put the lives of millions of Americans in disarray. In the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, la pandemia de nuestras vidas, we are fighting to survive. Latinos and Latinas, along with other communities of color, have become the backbone of the United States during this crisis, all while bearing the brunt of the pandemic. This hour is dedicated to our people, those who need us and those who lead us. The, the rich people, they, they don't even need to go out. You know, they can stay home and they, they're, they've been tended to. And the people around here? It's, it's you know, we, we struggle to survive. Since the beginning of the coronavirus crisis, Latinos have been the essential workers on the front lines. The farmers, the grocery store clerks, the delivery people, the meat and poultry plant employees. Jobs that cannot be done through Zoom meetings from the comfort of your home. Only one in six Latinos has a job that lets them work remotely. Many of them are balancing. On the one hand, I don't want the crisis of getting sick. On the other hand, I don't want the crisis of being homeless because I can't pay rent and I can't buy food. They are the ones that keep the economy going while risking their lives. If you think about the virus as a wild fire, we are dry tinder in a way. If there are no workers because we get all sick and it's impossible to sustain their work because of that, then there's no food. What are people going to do? High poverty rates, low wages, insufficient savings, lack of access to adequate health care, the highest rate of unemployment and uninsured of any race or ethnicity in the country. People of color throughout the world, really, have been disproportionately affected 
in, for many reasons. One is that overall people of color tend to have lower socioeconomic situations and lower access to health care. Dr. Eileen Marty is a Navy veteran and professor of infectious diseases at Florida International University in Miami with decades of experience around the world. What is the one most important thing that people need to understand about coronavirus and about this pandemic? This is one of the most lethal viruses that we have seen against humans in decades that is this easily spread. We have modern medicine. We have great techniques. We have ICUs. We have ventilators. That changes the parameters of who dies if we didn't have all these amazing modern tools, all this new knowledge of immunology. It would have killed a billion people. Dr. Marty knows a thing or two about viruses. For decades, she has been called upon by the World Health Organization to aid in health epidemics around the world, including Ebola in West Africa. You're Cuban American, so you know the Latino community fairly well. What are the health factors and the cultural factors that make Latinos more susceptible to this disease? We are a warm and loving people. We love to embrace our friends which the virus finds fantastic because it, we're, we're breaking that six foot barrier. And that's unfortunate in this circumstance. And it has to do with the health disparities in the country in part. It has to do with, uh, again, what underlying conditions we're more prone to as, as Latin Americans, um, obesity, diabetes, heart conditions, all those things that make it more likely that we end up in the ICU. Dr. Eileen De Leon has seen the disease up close and personal at Bellevue Hospital in New York that early on became the epicenter of the outbreak. It was unlike anything I had seen before and could have imagined for this year. In a matter of a year, Dr. De Leon went from a doctor to be graduating from NYU School of Medicine to the front lines in the war against COVID. All of this coronavirus pandemic has felt unfair, um, not only because of the way that uh, patients are isolated in the hospital, away from their families, but in the way that they end up in the hospital as well, and the disparities um, as far as who gets the virus and who doesn't in New York City. You use the word unfair. That's interesting. Why unfair? I use the word unfair because I do think, uh, for example, in New York City, there were populations that were able to leave the city. But then there was a group of folks who were considered essential workers who had to continue to ride the subways, who had to continue to present at work um, and not be provided with adequate protection against the virus. Latinos suffered the most deaths of any ethnic group in New York City. Dr. De Leon says that between 50 to 75 percent of the patients at Bellevue Hospital were Latino. I received calls from family members asking whether or not their loved one's immigration status would be in jeopardy because they had been hospitalized for so long, and uh, whether or not emergency Medicaid was going to be covering a lot of uh, their services. As people around the country are eager for some kind of normalcy, Dr. Marty reminds us that the pandemic is far from over, and she says the debates over whether to wear a mask should stop. Are masks effective? Yes. There's no question that masks, study after study has shown, decrease the transmission of this infection. Someone asked me a similar question yesterday and they said, well, you know, isn't it a matter of our freedom, right? That we should be able to not have to wear a mask. And I say, well, is it a matter of our freedom that we don't have to stop at a stop sign? It's the same concept. I'm protecting myself by not running that stop sign and I'm protecting you by stopping at that stop sign. There seems to be pandemic fatigue or quarantine fatigue in the population. As cities begin to reopen little by little, um, looks like people are not heeding the warning of experts, of medical experts. What concerns you the most about that? Well, again, the virus really doesn't care whether we feel fatigued or not. And you have to remember that maybe 1% of our population has had this virus right now. At most, 6%. There are plenty of 
plenty of people yet for this virus to enter into, and it will do so if we give it the opportunity. A stark reminder that it's not just about numbers, but about people, loved ones we lost. I remember the New York Times article that posted around the time where we had 100,000 deaths in, uh, in the US, and I would say remember that each of those individuals was a father, a son, a mother, a daughter, and that the world has really uh, lost so much. I need you to do me a favor. Actually, I need you to do the entire community a favor. Please wear a mask. I mean, it's that simple. It protects you, it protects me, it protects everyone. Wear a mask, wash your hands, practice social distancing, and let's move on from this. Take care, be safe, and I love you a bunch. Latino households are feeling the impact of coronavirus, and at least half of them have someone in their families who lost their jobs or had their salary reduced. Trying to make ends meet is even more difficult when you don't qualify for a stimulus check or unemployment because of your legal status or the type of work that you do. Omar Villafranca spoke to essential workers who are trying to survive against the odds. Mom. Undocumented. Dad. Undocumented. Sister. Undocumented. You. Undocumented. Oh, you have DACA but status. DACA. And I have a younger brother, but he was born here. Okay. We met 26-year-old Fatima in Oklahoma. The DACA recipient asked us not to use her last name because she worries people might retaliate against her family. Fatima is an essential employee at two jobs. I'm pulling up to my other job. She helps teenagers battle drug and sexual abuse. Take my temperature, log it, sanitize my hands. And also assists at the local homeless youth shelter. She's lucky since some of her co-workers were recently let go. Her parents and sister still have jobs for now, but their hours were cut. But if you don't have income coming in in this pandemic, how is that gonna affect me oh, that? Everything, everything, everything. Tell me. Everything, because um, I'm also paying for my school out of pocket. So everything was gonna be start, you know, bills are gonna come up. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Fatima says her family has taken extra precautions to stay safe. Yet, she is alarmed about rising rates of COVID-19 cases in the Latino community. You do have health insurance. Your yes. dad does not? No. What about your mom? No. So what happens if they get sick? Everything comes out of pocket. Everything? Everything comes out of pocket. So we live day by day. That's what I always tell people. We live day, day by day. That's how we take it. Despite the risk of bringing COVID-19 home, Fatima continues to work to provide a stable income for her family. Javier Quiroz Castro only gets one day a week to spend with his wife Haley and their one-year-old daughter Isabel. The rest of the time, he puts on a work uniform of PPE. Javier is a 29-year-old registered nurse. He treats COVID-19 patients at Houston Methodist West Hospital in a state where the numbers are surging. We don't really have much of a margin for error, especially me and my wife. We, you know, we have to come home to a one-year-old baby. Making it home to his family wasn't always a guarantee. His wife is a U.S. citizen, but Javier is not. He's a DACA recipient, something he says he can't worry about while treating patients in a pandemic. I don't really have time to focus on my, you know, my immigration struggles and my immigration status. My patients need me there. They don't really care if I'm illegal or undocumented. They don't really care if I'm a DACA recipient. You know, he has this unwavering faith. He's, he's, he's challenged every day with, you know, pushed into this unit of having to take care of these COVID-19 patients on top of having in the background hey, you know, I might have to go to Mexico sometime soon and leave my wife and child. But here's Javier dressed for work. Javier's case was the focus of Illinois Senator Dick Durbin's speech on the Senate floor when the senator was pushing to protect DACA. I want to thank Javier Quiroz Castro for his service. He is indeed a health care hero. Both Fatima and Javier are saving lives while working in a country that doesn't recognize them as full citizens. Javier says he works to make the American dream a reality for his little girl. I want her to look back and know that her dad really put up a fight and 
as he was fighting, he was taking care sometimes of the very people that wanted him out just to prove to this country that he's worthy. I'm Mireya Villarreal reporting in Fort Worth, Texas, where we turn to Ramiro Cavazos, Lorena Tule Romain, and Dolores Huerta to gather some practical advice on how to navigate through this pandemic. Ramiro Cavazos advocates for economic development among Latino-owned businesses across the country. Lorena Tule Romain supports undocumented children and their families. She also helped put together a brigade of Dreamer teachers to serve in low-income communities around the United States. We met them at Tinney's, a local restaurant forced to close down for several months because of coronavirus restrictions. And joining us from her home in California, where we are keeping her safe, is 90-year-old activist and civil rights icon, Dolores Huerta. Dolores, my mother, when she was a young child, was a migrant worker, and she would travel from South Texas all the way up to Michigan every year. I couldn't help but think about them in this moment. What is it about this group that makes them so vulnerable right now? Number one, they're not recognized. They're sort of invisible. So many of uh, the essential workers are, you might say, the invisible workforce. And that, of course, applies to people that work in the hospitality industry, the janitors out there that clean our buildings, and, and everybody that works out there to keep us safe. When I talk about uh, protections against COVID, but also the legislative protections, like for the farm workers, California and Hawaii, and I think recently New York State, are the only ones that cover farm workers with any kind of disability insurance, workers' compensation, uh, so that if they do get sick, that they are protected. The Pew Research Foundation came out with a new poll. It said 61% of Hispanics either have lost their job, know someone who has, or have taken a significant pay cut because of the coronavirus situation. Right. How is that possible and why? Why is this happening? Five million Hispanic-owned businesses employ majority Latinos, and one out of every four of our businesses in America have been affected through this coronavirus. It's very clear that many of our businesses, especially our workers, don't have the luxury of working from home during this period. And 80% of the jobs in America are jobs created by small business owners. And we form 60 million people living in America, and we are doing the work construction, all of the direct labor jobs and high-tech and low-tech jobs. So this has shown us that we're interconnected, but it's shown a greater appreciation also to everyone that we can't take for granted our Latino workers. 58% of Latino families have a laptop in their homes or a computer. Only 61% have access to broadband internet service. It clearly points out that there is this learning gap that was there and now the digital divide is even bigger. Yeah, absolutely. We saw a lot with the families that we work at M schools, what that meant to, to fastly just switch over to an online learning without having the essentials to actually be successful in their learning. To your point of the statistics, a lot of the parents that we work with didn't have that internet. And they were like, how am I supposed to turn in this assignment? I have to drive and sit outside of a library or, or a McDonald's to get a, a white spot to be able to do my that learning. That actually doing that? Yes, well, students were doing that and continue to, to say like, how am I supposed to be engaged? We also saw a lot of older siblings helping the little ones because to what we mentioned earlier, a lot of our parents are essential workers and they didn't have the option to stay home. And some of them didn't even own a computer at home. And we had to really be creative in how do we reach that gap that, that school districts were not taking into account. Dolores, I know that you obviously work very closely with undocumented families, with migrant families. How are they keeping up with this? It's going to be devastating to our Latino families, and we are going to have to, we were behind to, to begin with, and now we're going to have to do so much more to catch up, not only on the issues of, of the internet, the lack of computers, the lack of broadband, as, as was just mentioned, uh, but actually the resources that are going into our Latino communities. And the other thing that's really important is that there's a big piece of legislation now in the Senate called the HEROES Act. This is going to be so important to bring in the resources that we need into the community. But we know that to get there, too, we have to get people to vote. I have families that are telling me, look, I haven't paid a house bill six months. I'm hiding my car from the repo man because I'm, I haven't paid my, my bills yet. What is the priority for these families? The best thing for our families to do that are struggling with 
paying their bills, essential bills, is to call the people who hold their utility agreement or their credit card bills. Just asking for delay or deferments, many of those are being uh, extended by internet companies. Everything's interconnected. If that person stops being a customer, that's a customer they won't have for the future. And we know that schools around the country right now are still trying to figure out what things will look like in the fall. What are you telling families that they need to be mindful of as September rolls around? For parents specifically, I want them to make sure they are part of those conversations to make sure we are co-creating with the school leaders what that could look like. Are they going to be provided with Wi-Fi or a computer to make sure that if it's a hybrid model, they have those tools to actually submit all their assignments or testing, whatever they have to do for their course load, and really making sure we're providing that support. Ramiro, as we're talking about advice and how you continue to keep people's spirits up in these moments, I mean, you're talking to businesses that have lost everything, individuals that are struggling to pay monthly bills. What advice are you giving them financially to try and wade through this pandemic? If a Latino-owned business can succeed through this, even through a rejection or through this COVID-19 virus, one door that closes means another door is opening up. More than 20% of Americans are Latinos today, but we're gonna be more resilient because as a community, we have had to be resilient for more than 200 years. Dolores, I, I have to turn to you as well. You have 70 plus years fighting injustices within our community. Now is the moment where I, I, I need a little bit of hope from you as well. What are those words of advice that you're giving families right now? Most important thing that we have to give our children is, is a sense of pride. And once they have that, no matter what they throw at them, what discriminations that they face, that they will be able to take it and fight back, okay? I think the problem that we have with, with our Latino communities is that they don't think that they matter. They don't realize how important there are. So we need immigrants and documented people. Everybody take this seriously. Take the census serious, seriously and, uh, and take the voting seriously because we talked about how during the, the COVID-19, we've had to stay at home so that we don't get other people sick. Well, you know what? If we don't cooperate, basically we are saying to people out there, we don't care about you. We don't care about our family. This is for our families. This is for our community. This is, this is for our country. So, por favor, si se puede. Si se puede, si se puede. This virus isn't only affecting the elderly like initially reported. So we should not only be thinking about ourselves, but also all of our loved ones who fall under every age group. And don't confuse self-distancing for self-isolation. Self-distancing does not mean self-isolation, okay? So reach out, be in touch with your loved ones, and please, please, please be kind to yourself and others. Thousands of people are still in ICE detention centers across the country. These men, women, and children live in conditions where it is nearly impossible to avoid close contact. This is what it's like inside ICE detention centers in the middle of a global pandemic. Camilo Montoya Galvez reports. Y yo quería ir correr. Quería ir a salvar a mi hermanito porque dije yo, ay Dios mío, ya no lo voy a poder volver a ver. ¿Qué está pasando? Dije yo, ¿por qué no lo llevó migración a tiempo al hospital? Carlos Escobar Mejía was the first immigrant to die after getting the coronavirus while in ICE detention. His sister fears other detainees could meet the same fate. Porque yo mi hermanito, hermanito, yo lo quería como que fuera su madre. Así lo miraba como mi hijo. Y que me haya pasado esto. Es una gran injusticia. But thousands continue to be detained, even as coronavirus cases grow. We're not treated like human here. We are definitely not. Que me dejen salir. Fear is running higher than usual inside ICE detention centers across the country. For those locked up, the coronavirus outbreak is spreading fast. And the detainees we spoke to say they're sitting ducks. And I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing about my case. I'm arguing about the health of people here. I care more about someone's life than me being incarcerated. I'd rather lose my freedom than end my life. 
What can ICE do to better protect you? Detainees say social distancing is impossible inside, and resources to prevent getting the virus are slim. But you had to fight for that. ICE says it has released hundreds of at-risk immigrants since the beginning of the outbreak. The agency has repeatedly maintained that it is protecting employees and detainees. Their outlying conditions are all taken into consideration uh, if you know, they are deemed uh, to not be a risk of uh, a danger to the public or a flight of risk, then they potentially are released. Yet many with chronic health issues and underlying conditions, like 54-year-old Griselda Melendez, continue to be held in custody. The reason ICE continues to detain Melendez as the virus spreads? The agency denied her parole, citing a criminal conviction of harboring undocumented immigrants. You think you deserve another opportunity? The pandemic didn't change the daily toil of life as a farm worker. It changed how many are seen. Undocumented became essential. In Immokalee, Florida, we met Gloria Carrera in April. Here, you have to do what it takes to make a living, she said. For her, it was picking tomatoes to support her two children until the pandemic hit. The truth is you leave with fear that you'll come back home sick, fear that you could make your children, your family sick. Gloria stopped working. Most kept going, boarding buses to the fields. Some growers added hand-washing stations. But seeing that testing for COVID-19 lagged behind here, the coalition of Immokalee workers started ringing the alarm. Because if you think about it, about the virus as a wildfire, uh, we are dry tinder in a way. This is what Collier County, where Immokalee is located, looks like now a hot spot on Florida's COVID-19 map. We returned in June. One organization known for helping vulnerable populations around the globe, Doctors Without Borders, is actually here in Immokalee. You can see their volunteers there in the white vests. Susan Doyle says the organization recognized the need here. They're not able to work from home, so they have to go to work every day. Um, they're often living in, in quite crowded housing, um, using group transport to and from work. And it's particularly difficult to isolate um, for this population, so that's also uh, very scary for them. Gloria. We checked in with Gloria. So you went back to work for a few days, regresó a trabajar unos días, sí, y dijo que ya no por... Ya de, ya no. Porque ya no, no había precaución, ya no, no enough precautions. Traté de mejor proteger a mis hijos, dije, no, me protejo yo, you have to protect you in order to protect your children. Gloria has diabetes. Her partner's income is just enough to cover the rent. No tienen acceso al desempleo, right? You have no access to unemployment. You have no health insurance, no seguros. No seguro ni nada de eso. Y otra entrada no hay. What's the other income? No hay otra entrada. For her and so many others here, the concern is on two fronts: home and the home they left behind. I start thinking about my mother, she says. She's also diabetic. Where does she live? In Mexico. Mexico, a country in the throes of the outbreak. Fears over what the virus could unleash upon Latin America first materialized here, Ecuador. It's believed a woman returning from Spain imported the virus. Within weeks, deaths overwhelmed the largest city, Guayaquil. Corpses were left on the street. At least 3,000 Ecuadorians have died, including colleagues of Dr. Luis Yepes, who we spoke with in April. We have to wait to mourn another time, he says. What we have to do is face the situation head on. As the virus spread throughout Latin America, the region's severe inequalities, poor social safety net, and fragile infrastructure were laid bare. Nowhere has that proven more true than the region's largest country, Brazil. President Jair Bolsonaro has not only refused to enact lockdowns, he has defied social distancing guidelines and recently tested positive himself. 
While Brazil's poorest neighborhoods, or favelas, were left to try to disinfect themselves, it's now the world's second worst outbreak behind only the United States. The pain and concern of Latinos across the United States and the Americas is inevitably felt here in Washington. Some could argue that the political action or inaction in this city is partly responsible for the circumstances so many are now facing. But where you find humans in crisis, you also find humans willing to help. And we will devote the rest of this hour to those running towards the fire. We begin with Marco Rubio. The Cuban-American, Florida Republican senator is a lead author of the Paycheck Protection Program, which is designed to be a lifeline for companies struggling amid the pandemic. Everyone has small More than $600 billion is being distributed to thousands of businesses nationwide. That this was not a moment in which there was a Republican side or a Democrat side. This was a moment in which the entire nation was imperiled economically and we needed to act quickly. Critics say not enough of the money is reaching minority-owned small companies and their workers who desperately need the help. It's a concern that Rubio understands. Well, let me tell you what it's not. It's not a bailout. And my view of it is if the government's going to force you to close, then the government has a role to play in trying to the extent possible keep you whole. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to the extent possible to create a bridge between the pandemic and some return to normalcy that helped as many people as possible stay connected to their job. But the hope here is that you're keeping these companies aloft as long as possible. That's exactly right. And, and I don't mean to say that in a, to be insensitive about it. I think it's to be honest about it. When you have something like this happen, there will be harm done. There's been harm already done. Like if, if this was 30 years ago, uh, my dad worked at a hotel. My mom worked at uh, Kmart at the time. What would have happened to us when I was 15, 16, 17, 18 years of age if something like this would have happened then? Because they were, both would have been unemployed. Pretty sure of that. And, uh, and, I, and you think about those sorts of things. That's why Rubio hopes the Paycheck Protection Program is doing more than just putting money in the bank. For people who have never gone through that or seen it or lived it or been near it, you don't realize that the impact isn't just economic. It strikes right at the heart of what gives your life purpose and meaning and dignity for, for millions and millions of people. And we, 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 we're working on it. We're doing the best we can to address it. And that things are going to get better. It isn't going to be this way forever. We are the epicenter of the epicenter. Ponte la máscara, mi amor. Es... For many across the country, the last three months... You realize how many children are on the line? ...have upended their lives. That means their parents probably had to go back to work. So they sent the kids to pick it up. Mm-hmm, because I didn't have this many kids on the line before. And Latino leaders... How many? ...are rushing to help. You have a microwave? Uh, oh, oh. Okay. Based in Queens, New York, Catalina Cruz, a Colombian immigrant, is the first dream to serve in the New York State Assembly. Ah, hoy sí vino temprano, eso. Corrázame más, mi amor. These are really kind people who will get to the end of the line and we have no more food, and they have four meals, and they'll turn around and give two to the person behind them. She's an angel in this neighborhood. <laughs> her constituents let her know when they like her. I want she to be a mayor. Okay. And when they don't. She does many good things. No. She does You're wrong. illegals, not the people that live here. You see what I mean? By the morning of March 17th, five days before New York was ordered to stay home, Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz's district office became a food pantry. So this is where we have the food set up and we start giving it out and we kind of... Today, spread. her team gives out at least 2,000 meals a day. Buenas. Every day, the line wraps around the block. What's going through your head as you walk the line? But that could have been me and my mom. That had I not become one of the lucky ones, I'd be on a line with my mom. Well, what does it say that in the nation's largest city, allegedly the financial center of the country and of the world, an assemblywoman has to do this for her constituents? When they came time to help my people, they left us alone. They left us alone. I had lines of people. There were like 2,000. They left us alone to fight. And there are still days where we feel very alone. Many of those left alone are the essential workers, doing jobs that keep the economy humming, 
even without legal status. And it often feels like we are desechables. ¿Se acuerda de mí, cierto? We are the ones that can be thrown away. It's a very vibrant uh, part of our neighborhood. Hola, señor, ¿cómo está? These immigrants, Latinos and Latinas, are a critical part of society. A society is in individuals who have agreed mutually to live together, to share values, to share a future, and to share a country and, and, a and, and their communities. And you can't have a successful society if a significant percentage of the people in that society feel like it's not working out for them. Provide diapers, help them find jobs, be a shoulder to cry on. Am I missing anything? And it's a lot. It is, but I sometimes feel like it's not enough. I, my people need so much, I sometimes feel like, am I doing enough? We have to practice uh, social distancing. We have to make sure that we wear our masks. I know that summer is right around the corner and uh, we love our gatherings with our family. We love to congregate. Um, let's just make sure we, we stay safe. That's most important. In moments of crisis, it is the helpers who step up when most needed. While Latinos and Latinas on the front lines are in an all-out battle against COVID-19, there are leaders in our ranks helping us rise above. Activists and philanthropists reaching into their pockets and using their platforms to stand up for essential workers in the Latino community at this time of crisis. Here is Adriana Diaz. As always, and in this pandemic, Latinos have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, helping themselves, and each other. Actor, director, and activist Eva Longoria has always fought for Latino rights through her own foundation and other causes. For this report, Eva joined actor, producer, and activist Wilmer Valderrama, who has long advocated for marginalized communities and is now also shedding light on essential workers through his new social media series, Six Feet Apart. How can we do what we do while still supporting you guys? and chef and humanitarian, Jose Andres. Take a look, very big space. Uh, here we are feeding nurses, doctors, National Guard. Oh, yes. With his World Central Center. Kitchen is keeping America and the world fed at a time when money is short and food bank lines are long. It looks great. They were in three different time zones, far apart in distance, but not in mission. Hi, Eva. Hola. Hi, Wilmer. Hey, what's up? How are you? All right. What? <laughs> what are you, baby? <laughs> hey, Wilmar. How are you, sir? Nice to see you. Amigo, ¿qué tal? I was going to ask if you all knew each other, but I see that you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know each other very well. I'm going to just dive right in. How are you guys holding up? I mean, this has been such an intense experience. Wilmer, I know that you often say every morning that you wake up, you are... Already winning, yeah. If you woke up this morning, you're already winning. The sentiment is kind of the same for all of us. There's been a lot of um, reawakening of things and uh, reinvesting your time in, in things that are actually really important. Essential workers, farm workers, like the ones that you've raised money for, Eva, through the Farm Workers Pandemic Relief Fund, they are now getting recognition well overdue recognition but Eva what do you think of that recognition and how long do you think it'll last yeah I don't I don't know if we need recognition we need help um you know outside of a pandemic outside of this crisis farm workers work in poverty wages they have substandard living conditions they have a myriad of health problems because of those living conditions um crammed into one apartment. Uh, they have lack of access to, to health care. And now that we're in the in the pandemic, and, and it took that to call them essential workers, um, they are critical to our society and to our very existence. And so if we don't, we don't start to uh, create protections and legal protections, if that's not addressed, um, it will affect America's food supply. We need to uh, make sure that we're showing up for them because showing up for them is showing up for America. It's the most patriotic thing you can do. The most patriotic thing you can do. How do you think people can, can move from recognition to actually helping? Well, this is very simple. Um, the president of the United States should start recognizing the job that all these 
men and women are doing for our country. Congress should recognize this. We have 11 million undocumented. Many of them are Latinos. I used to think that you have to have a passport to belong. Uh, you know why you belong? You belong because you are giving your best to the country. So we need to pass immigration reform. This is a way to be recognizing them and to tell them that they belong, that they are not anymore ghosts of the system. We don't even look at their eyes. So let's just start looking at their eyes, at their hearts, and let's tell them, really, really, you're important and you are going to finally belong by passing immigration reform. You know, for so many people, this pandemic has made everyone feel helpless, anxiety. Do you ever feel that anxiety? Because you seem fearless, you know, and how do you turn that into action? Well, um, I use uh, realize that the urgency of now is yesterday. You know what? Uh, I think it's time that sometimes we give way too many speeches. We see the president of the United States giving a speeches, senators, congressmen giving a speeches. I think we are in this new moment of America that giving a speech and clapping it's no good anymore. We need to put boots on the ground and make sure that we take care of the problems in real time. This way, you don't have anxieties anymore. You know, as you look forward, Eva, you know, thinking about your adorable little son, Santi, when he gets older, what do you think you're going to teach him about this moment, especially, you know, him being a Latino in America? Yeah. God, I, I, I hope, my hope is that um, he sees how we um, all came together to confront, um, you know, a, a, a microscopic virus that um, really challenged everybody in, um, in the world. Outside of a crisis, the Latino community suffers already with inequity. 37% of Latinos don't have internet access. They just don't have Wi-Fi at home. And 32% of our households don't have uh, computers or equipment to accommodate uh, uh, these children, much less uh, their parents who are trying to work from home. The effects of these hardships are gonna continue to um, reduce exponentially. And so we're gonna have a lot of cleaning up to do. Now, all of you have been really involved in efforts to get out the vote. Are you concerned, Jose, that the pandemic will impede Latinos' ability to get to the polls? Obviously, we need to see what's gonna be happening in the fall. Uh, I'm not. I'm not an expert, but uh, that's why we need to work, if anything, harder to make sure that everybody understands that one vote equals their voices will be heard and everybody must go to vote. This pandemic is gonna spike and maybe the fall is gonna be much worse. So it's very important that we fight for being able to vote by mail, that we fight to make sure that they keep the, 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 the places, the polling places open. We have to participate in the census. Then we have to understand that, you know, those numbers have to register to vote. And if, if you are eligible to vote in your family, you have to represent that household. There is no other way to get around it. You, you have to vote in, on behalf of your family. Um, and register, you know, and the next thing is we have to show up. I just want to add as a, a voting, vote, census has, has been made very easy, um, but, but when it comes to voting, voter suppression is real, my friends. Um, so there are people making it not easy, okay? And if you look at, uh, you know, what just happened in Kentucky, the state had 3,200 polling place, places in 2018, and this, this time they had 200. They cut three thousand three thousand polling places why are we making it harder for people to vote it wasn't a surprise that half of black kentuckians lived in jefferson county and and they decided to put one polling place for six hundred thousand people that's going to happen all over the country eyes are on us right now um, of communities of color uh and us as latinos we have to understand we are intricately tied to our, our black uh, brothers and sisters as well. If, if you don't think what's happening in that community is not happening in our community, you are sadly mistaken. And so we have to uh, uh, hold hands and really come at this election uh, with just a wave of power uh, and a wave of a voice. And so, um, you know, 
we are behind Black Lives Matter. We are behind, um, you know, erasing uh, 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 voter suppression. There's a lot of Afro Latinas uh, in or Afro Latinx in our in our communities as well who identify as both. And so <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I, I just think that um, it would be amazing, amazing to somehow. Uh, unify um, the the communities of color so that we can really, I mean, really make a change. And as my last question on this topic, Latinos were super diverse, but there are some overarching themes, cultural connections, passion, work ethic, family values, love of food and dance and um, all of those things. But what do you think is the Latino characteristic that's going to help our community get through this? Jose? I would say that if the Latino community has an amazing uh, um, thing that brings us all together is this sense of family, not only of each other, but those people are not part of your family. That yes, we, we come from different places and, and I think this is gonna move through and is what is gonna help the Latino community to give a push to America as a whole. Uh, we, the people, all the people, People always ask me, you know, what is it about Latinos? Why are they always happy, you know? And, and uh, we don't have our shortage of, of uh, hits in our community. You know, when, when times get rough and the, and the storm gets a little louder, um, we turn our music just as, as loud. And uh, our music, you know, it's, you know, not only unites us, but brings the spirit of not just uh, hard work and family and unity, you know, but... Um, but uh, we keep swinging. And you know, summer is here. That means backyard barbecues, dancing, salsa, even reggaeton. So whatever you choose, please remember to take caution around your family members who have a pre-existing condition, which makes them very vulnerable, or people advance in age like myself. It took just a few months to have the lives of millions of Latinos and Latinas upended by the pandemic, but it could take a lot longer for many of them to put the pieces back together. There are still a lot of unanswered questions. When will it be safe to go to work without the danger of being infected? For those who lost their jobs, will they get them back? And will their salaries be the same? Will they be able to catch up on rent or unpaid bills? And will they be able to protect their family's health going forward? The one thing we do know is that for these Latino Americans, it is their hard work ethic, their sense of community, their resilience, and their deep faith that keeps them striving to obtain their American dream. I am Marielena Salinas. Thanks for watching. Thank you.